Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie Poser. I am the Outreach Librarian for the NOAA Central Library, and we are very excited to be here today giving you a teaser of the NOAA Fisheries Sea Grant Population and Ecosystem Dynamics and Marine Resource Economics Fellowship Research Symposium Teaser Seminars. Hi, thank you. So I'm Amanda Lawrence. I am the Fellowships Coordinator with the National Sea Grant Office. Um, thank you all for joining and thanks to the library for hosting. Um, so we are going to hear from four of our NIMS Sea Grant Population and Ecosystem Dynamics and Marine Resource Economics Fellows um, this afternoon. This is meant to be a teaser. They're all going to share a little bit about their research and their personal experiences in the fellowship. Um, and again, a teaser for the the research symposium that will be held at the end of this month, which you can find out um, more information about that and registration um, on the National Sea Grant website. Um, so to get started, um, I'm just gonna list our speakers in order and then turn it over to our first presenter. Um, so first we're gonna have Dr. Matt uh, Damiano uh, with the Southeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, he's a postdoctoral associate there. So just finished up his fellowship. Then we're gonna hear from um, Janelle Morano at Cornell University. She's a PhD candidate. Then we'll hear from Emily Chen uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. She's a PhD student. And then uh, Nima uh, Frashadi at San Diego State University, um, University of California. He's a PhD student there. Um, so I will turn off my camera and my mic, and I will turn it over to um, Dr. Damiano to start us off. Thanks again. Thanks for that introduction, Amanda. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Damiano. Uh, I am a postdoctoral associate at the Southeast Fisheries Science Center Beaufort Laboratory and the Cooperative Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Studies at the University of Miami. And I'm here to give you an update on the management strategy evaluation that's currently underway for common dolphin fish in the Western Atlantic. Just for reference, when I say Western Atlantic, I'm referring to the waters off of the Eastern Seaboard, as well as the Western Central Atlantic and the Caribbean Sea. Figuring out how to switch slides here. So common dolphin fish are a migratory species of pelagic fish with a really interesting life history. They're kind of like a tuna-sized forage fish in that they reach sexual maturity in their first year of life, typically live to an average of two years with, and no more than four. I say they have uncertain-ish stock structure because there have been a lot of tagging experiments that have uh, highlighted movement pathways, perhaps most notably uh, this annual movement circuit in which dolphin fish follow the Gulf Stream up the east coast of the U.S. during spring and summer, then out into open ocean during the fall, and then back into the Caribbean during the fall and the winter. Uh, what we also know from some genetic work is that there's not a lot of difference between dolphin fish caught within this range. And because of their high level of movement, they often cross international boundaries, and so they support a lot of different fisheries at different spatial and temporal scales. Management of Western Atlantic dolphin fish technically falls under the purview of the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, or ICAT, but they are classified as other fishes with no international policy governing management. There are also a lot of data limitations that hinder management of the stock. Here in the eastern U.S., dolphin fish are managed under the Dolphin Wahoo Fishery Management Plan by the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council. There's no fishery independent survey being one of these fishes like tunas or swordfish that hang out in the open ocean and move around a lot. And although there have been several efforts to assess the stock in different parts of its range, none of those assessment models have resulted in reliable biological reference points for use in management. So the South Atlantic Council uses a average of past catches in order to come up with an annual catch limit, which is a pretty data-limited management strategy. So why do an MSC for Western Atlantic dolphin fish? Well, if none of the points on the last slide were sufficiently compelling, uh, the current management strategy is really not responsive to what we suspect are environmentally driven productivity and availability of the fish. 
So dolphin fish like to hang out in a relatively narrow band of sea surface temperature, kind of a Goldilocks sweet spot. And they do this when they reproduce and catch rates tend to be highest when they're hanging out in this uh, band of temperature. It's also a unique opportunity to test out empirical management procedures that might be more responsible, might be more responsive to interannual or even interseasonal changes in abundance, such as one that tracks with an index. Plus, since the population likely has a very complex spatial structure, it would be good to look at management strategies that are spatially consistent, but also manage to tailor to regional needs. So I've outlined uh, a simplified roadmap to an MSE for the uh, portion of dolphinfish available to the Eastern US, which is really NOAA's focus here. And for that, we need a list of conceptual objectives so we understand what the myriad stakeholders want from the fishery and have something to measure performance metrics from the MSC against. We also need a decent understanding of the uncertainties in the management system. So this includes the dolphin fish's biology and ecology, the fishery dynamics, the socioeconomics, and potential environmental drivers. And then if we're going to test out an empirical management procedure that uses an index, we're going to need some kind of index. And so there have been a couple of projects uh, that have been underway to address these needs. The first of which is the one that the fellowship has been funding for me, which is modeling the spatiotemporal dynamics of Western Atlantic. And so the goal of this project was to develop an index or multiple regional indices of relative abundance that are going to be robust to the spatial and spatiotemporal variation in their population dynamics. And so what I did for this was fit multiple vector autoregressive spatiotemporal models to the U.S. commercial pelagic longline logbook data for dolphin fish during 1986 to 2022. This is notably a fishery dependent source of information as well as a commercial one in a set of fisheries whose makeup is really dominated by the recreational sectors. The second project, which has been led by Drs. Cassidy Peterson, Mandy Karnauskas, and Matt McPherson, has been aimed at conducting a number of stakeholder workshops up and down the East Coast US in order to introduce the prospect of the MSC as well as the prospect of an empirical management procedure, but also to identify those conceptual objectives as well as uncertainties in the management system from the stakeholders perspective. So jumping right into the results of the first project, this is the estimated trend of relative abundance for dolphin fish throughout the entirety of that Western Atlantic range. And what you'll notice right away is even among all of these seasons, which are listed by color, there's not really much of a trend up until about 2018 when we see this uh, sharp decline. It's not immediately clear what's driving this and due to the nature of spatiotemporal models, more work is going, to be need to, is going to need to be done in order to tease apart the effects of both the fisheries and the environment that are overlapping in space and time. However, it is worth noting that effort in both commercial sectors and recreational sectors has remained high for many years recently. If we stratify this index by regions, uh, there are some interesting trends. So I have from left to right, the Mid-Atlantic Bite, South Atlantic Bite, Florida waters, which include Eastern Florida and the Keys, and then the Caribbean Sea. Generally, we see no trend in these except for toward the end, maybe a little bit of a negative trend in Florida and the Caribbean Sea. We also see that seasonally, uh, each of those indices track a little bit more closely in Florida and the Caribbean Sea, which aligns with what we know about the timing of dolphin fish movement. Where the biggest difference seems to occur is in the South Atlantic Bight, where we see this sort of decoupling between the spring and summer indices in blue and green, respectively. Uh, over the last few years. We also don't see as much of a pronounced decline at the end. What's really noteworthy is that all of these patterns are consistent with the catch time series from the MRIP data, as well as being consistent with stakeholder perceptions of regional availability and uh, perceptions of relative abundance in the area. And so in the South Atlantic Bite, for example, folks haven't been noticing as much of a decline in recent years, and it looks like they're picking that up in these signals. We also looked at the center of gravity by season and the overall pattern of the center of gravity over the entire time series. On the right, I have the, uh, the time series of the center of gravity where we, again, don't really see any clear trend, although there is a lot of uncertainty. 
What's really noteworthy is if you imagine these two figures over here on the right, the box plots with the northings on top of the eastings, they essentially form that annual circuit by season, which they're moving uh, up the coastline of the US and then back around again through the Caribbean. So that's really fascinating. Since we're working with a fishery dependent uh, source of data to derive this index, we wanted to look at the center of gravity of the nominal effort in the pelagic longline fleet. And we do see pretty different centers of gravity estimated here, as well as a different pattern overall by season, which uh, to me suggests that the model is doing a good job of integrating out the effects of bargaining of this fleet on both dolphin fish and other species. And also since we are using a commercial data set, we wanted to do some other post hoc analyses to determine whether or not these trends are robust to both commercial and recreational trends uh, throughout the range. So we looked at correlations between seasonal and regional indices with other independent catch time series. Uh, over on the left, we have the summer and fall large pelagic species survey conducted via headboat in uh, the mid-Atlantic bite. In the middle, we have correlations between the spring and summer indices for South Atlantic bite in Florida with the hook and line fisheries for dolphin fish from North Carolina and Florida, respectively. And then on the right, we have correlations between the fall, winter, and spring indices for the Caribbean with some recreational tournament data from Puerto Rico during uh, that same time. And for a lot of these, the correlations are relatively strong, which um, suggests that potentially these results are indeed robust to both commercial and recreational trends. So changing gears to the other project, uh, what we found from these stake stakeholder workshops were a number of consistencies in both conceptual objectives and uncertainties. With respect to the conceptual objectives, the four that came up most consistently were ensuring opportunity and access to the fishery, preventing fishery closures, uh, catching larger sized fish, and having stability in regulations. And then the main uncertainties identified by folks were movement of dolphin fish, catchability and availability, removals, uh, magnitude of removals specifically, and the effects of the environment. I've put an asterisk next to both of these because although I don't have time to get into them here, there were region specific differences. Now I've emboldened uh, these three uh, aspects here because these have essentially been the guide in selecting a framework to start designing the operating models for the MSC. And so what we settled upon as a group is uh, using a, a modification of the size structured spatiotemporal assessment model designed by Chow et al where we need to be able to address the size-based objectives. We also need to be able to address the region-specific differences in objectives and the uncertainty of movement. And we believe that this framework has the potential to deal with all of that. And so moving forward, what we'll be doing is using the population dynamics trends from VAST to condition N in each of the areas. We're going to try to do six areas minimum, potentially up to eight with movement between them and alternate movement hypotheses for testing. And we're going to look at this at a minimum of a seasonal time step, but potentially as fine as a monthly time step. So where we're at in terms of the larger project is we've essentially completed the two projects that I introduced here and we're working on building the management strategy evaluation operating models this summer. We're hoping to make some major headway on that this month and then this fall. We're going to start working on building the management procedures, which uh, may use the VAST index, but also other indices from throughout the range. Uh, and we're going to work on refining uh, the VAST indices, the MSE tool, and the management procedures so that in around early 2024, we can meet up with a small group of volunteers from these workshops and sort of engage in that iterative process that is uh, the hallmark of MSE. And then we're going to target completion of this project by about fall 2024, or potentially early 2025. 
And so that's everything I have for you today. So I'd like to thank the NIMS Sea Grant Population and Ecosystem Dynamics Fellowship Program for uh, giving me this opportunity, as well as all of my partners in these projects. And I will take questions at the end of the seminar. Thanks, Matt. Moving on to Janelle Moreno. Janelle, please take it away. Hi, um, I'm going to talk today uh, about quantitative characterization of fine scale distributional changes for spatially managing fishery fisheries. I'm a PhD candidate at Cornell University, uh, supported by the fellowship. Uh, and I am advised by Patrick Sullivan, and my NIMS advisor is Kevin Friedland. So the Western North Atlantic Ocean off the Northeast of the United States is one of the fastest changing ocean regions in the world. Uh, the ocean is rapidly warming, acidification and salinity are increasing, chlorophyll is decreasing and ocean stratification is intensifying. And under this fundamental change, species must adapt, move or perish. There we go. And so one adaptive response to the warming ocean is for fish species to shift their habitat locations according to their thermal tolerance. So this means that generally along the U.S. Atlantic coast, marine fishes are expanding their distributions northward and uh, moving into deeper water. So we're finding more warm water species in the northeast than we had in the past and cold water species are declining. But the specific patterns of distribution for each species varies because different ecological processes are interacting at different spatial and temporal scales. So when these dynamics are disrupted, the result may be that some species distributions shift, contract, expand, or become fragmented. And these changes are not homogenous across a species range. And these changing distributions impact how we manage fisheries. So on the East Coast, there are three fisheries management councils, plus the Caribbean and the Cooperative Atlantic States Commission, two science centers that support the councils, and then over 80 species that cross national and international jurisdictions with cooperation and coordination um, depending on the species. So changes in distribution can disrupt an already complex management system. And shifts in distribution and declines in population productivity impact uh, which fish are available to fishermen and what their economic outlook is. And so this can depend on things like how far fishers have to go to get to where the fish are and what laws govern what and where they can catch. And um, you can quantify changes in species distribution with models that predict where a species is as it correlates to environmental data and then measure those changes over time. And then taking it further and forecasting where species will be in the future uh, can be useful for managing fisheries and the fishing industry. So I'm specifically interested in forage fish uh, because of their role in the ecosystem. They are sensitive to environmental conditions and they typically have variable populations. But we often know less about forage species because less data is typically available. And so for my uh, dissertation re research, I'm focusing on the spatial distribution of forage fish in three parts. First is the current distribution. Where are they and how has this distribution changed? And then uh, where will they be in the future? And then finally, how can this uh, spatial information, uh, particularly from forecasts, be incorporated as relevant and impactful information into management? So as a case study of forage fishes, I'm currently focusing on Atlantic menhaden. Uh, this is the largest fishery by biomass on the East Coast. They're caught for a bait fish and a reduction fishery. They're filter feeders um, feeding on phytoplankton. Adults school and spawn along the coast, moving inshore and northward in the spring and summer, and then moving southward in the fall. The larvae and juveniles settle into estuaries, uh, particularly the Chesapeake Bay and along the North Carolina coast until they mature. In recent years, more menhaden have been reported from um, about New York to Maine, which gets the attention of fishers and then gets the attention of whale watchers who are seeing more whales in the uh, near shore. And both of these are reasons for managers to take note. 
So one of the issues in managing a species like Manhattan is that the total allowable catch set for the year is divided among states based on historical catches. So as Manhattan catches increase in some states, those states would like to see their allocations also increase. So I'm interested in understanding how Manhattan distribution may be changing and the heterogeneity that may be occurring across its entire range. And then what's the influence of environmental factors such as uh, temperature, depth, and chlorophyll? So for my data, I'm using adult Manhattan biomass from multiple fisheries independent surveys of data sets. And there are a lot of details that differentiate all of these different uh, surveys, but the important features here that I want you to understand are that I have federal surveys and state surveys. The federal surveys spatially cover a larger area from near shore to offshore along the continental shelf uh, since 1972. Um, in the green um, or light blue, uh, the white lines are uh, delineate statistical survey areas within the federal survey. And then the state surveys in the dark blue or purple color um, are largely inshore in bays and rivers um, since and have a, been happening for at least the past two decades um, with a lot of variation. Uh, depth and bottom temperature are concurrently collected with most surveys and chlorophyll A concentrations are available through remote sensing. So based in large part on the constraints of the data sets, I'm comparing um, two seasonal time periods uh, through spatial models versus the spring that covers from March and April and then comparing it to the fall from uh, which covers from September to October. So I am grossly oversimplifying all the details of the models but uh, because what I want you to take from this is that we can look at Manhattan biomass at different spatial scales through different approaches. So first we can look at space as a categorical um, region or statistical survey areas and smooth over time. But no, um, and this I'm going to be showing uh, is done in uh, a GAM model. But knowing that temperature, depth, and chlorophyll vary across the landscape and that uh, points that are closer to each other will be more similar than points that are farther apart from each other. We can also use a spatio-temporal model that explicitly accounts for the effects of space, time, and then the interaction between the two to estimate the density of Manhattan at a finer scale. And today I'll be presenting um, uh, within the vast model. Uh, and again, what I'm presenting today is just a snapshot of work that's in progress. So um, looking at the fit of the first model, uh, which is the GAN model or uh, space as a categorical variable. So um, spring is on the left and fall is on the right, and this will continue for the rest of my presentation. Um, the color corresponds to the regions along the east coast that are marked on the map on the left. Going from top to bottom is north to south, dark to bright, blue to yellow. And so when we look at Manhattan biomass in the spring on the left, Note that the scale of the y-axis of each of these stack graphs is different, um, and that's so that you can actually see the regional pattern. Because the northern regions have uh, by far the lowest biomass, while the mid-Atlantic region has the highest biomass, upwards of 20,000 times the biomass in the north. And the variance is very low across areas. Um, all regions have an increase in biomass uh, after around 2010 but that increase uh, is not in the same years in each region. Now looking at the fall on the right, biomass is much lower than in the spring overall. Um, and then there's a lot more variation among the years and between the middle and south regions. The north again has the lowest biomass of the regions and is essentially swamped out of this figure. So now looking at a map to illustrate what is spatially happening over the decades, um, these maps are showing the mean annual change in biomass within the statistical survey areas of the federal survey. So biomass has been increasing, designated in yellow, um, in areas in the south in the spring, and then in areas in the north in the fall. And then those areas with decreasing trends in purple um, are, or dark blue are in the lower mid-Atlantic and south. 
So now we can look at a finer resolution of distribution um, with a uh, another model. Um, so this is the spatiotemporal model, again, um, where space and time and the interaction of the two are explicitly accounted for in the model. And so the output here is uh, estimated density for every year. Um, and the color scale uh, refers to the log density of Menhaden. So the brighter yellow is high density and low is dark blue. And note that the density is lower in the spring on the left than the fall on the right. Um, previously, I showed you how biomass is higher in the spring, but um, now we are looking at estimates of, at latitude and longitude coordinates, so at a finer scale, instead of estimates over larger spatial areas. So as, or, um, excuse me, as you are watching this, uh, because of the lag of the internet um, and your connection, uh, Things will be jumping around, I expect that. Um, and there are some years that uh, become out of sync uh, between fall and spring, it's because there's a couple of years missing in the data. But as uh, you cycle through all this information, um, I wanna point out some major trends. Uh, so the first, hopefully very obvious one, is that there's a lot of variation between years. Second, there is broader distribution in the spring than in the fall. And in the fall, they are more dense uh, in shore and north. Um, and then lastly, there are regions of high density at uh, the Chesapeake, um, North Carolina, and then the New York, uh, New Jersey, New York Bight region. Um, so how do we take all this information and put it in some sort of digestible metrics? We commonly measure change in a species distribution with the center of gravity. Uh, which Matt previously mentioned, um, or also range edges to measure the overall distributional change. Um, so that's over the entire uh, distribution. And so looking at the center of gravity for each season, um, the location of the weighted mean of density varies between years, but there's really not a strong trend over time. And the scale of the changes is quite narrow um, and corresponds to the small little blue dot uh, off of the Chesapeake Bay on the map. And given the variation I previously showed between regions, um, are there alternatives uh, to quantify and monitor changes occurring within a distributional range? Um, this is what I'm working on right now. Um, so I'm exploring ways to look at how uh, regions of relative high density, um, wh where they're occurring and how those areas may be changing over time. So in summary of what I know so far, uh, there are definitely seasonal spatial differences. So in the spring, there is higher biomass overall, but Manhattan are less dense and more broadly distributed. In the fall, there's lower biomass overall, but they're more dense inshore and in the north. And then more biomass is uh, in the lower latitudes in both seasons. And then there are annual spatial uh, differences. So biomass is increasing overall at about 2010, um, but mostly in the mid-Atlantic. And then there are annual variations um, between the regions. So quantifying these changes could be impactful on state allocations, um, but you could also imagine that at uh, that finer scale spatial measurements are useful for monitoring changes in distribution that maybe are more easily detected than at a range scale. And I still have more work to do on quantifying those spatial, those smaller uh, spatial scales of change, um, but I also will be addressing mapping uncertainty for understanding the limits of these predictions and evaluating risk and management decisions. And finally, for my dissertation, uh, future steps in forecasting distributions and addressing how the spatial information can be relevant and impactful to fisheries management. So I'd like to um, thank the fellowship for funding my work and also the New York uh, Department of Environmental Conservation. And I will take questions at the end of this talk or contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Janelle. I'm gonna move it on to our next presenter, Emily Chen.
Uh, hey everyone, um, I'm going to be talking about, uh, give an overview of the population dynamics of California Central Valley Chinook salmon and um, kind of giving an overview of uh, the various stocks within the system and uh, issues and uh, pieces of my research that I'm uh, hoping to address. So um, a little bit of background on, I was really drawn to studying this uh, system for my PhD and it's partially because it's so uh, complicated both biologically but also complicated in terms of human uh, demands. Uh, it's one of the largest, it's the largest drainage basin in the state. Uh, it has a huge footprint as you can see from the map. Uh, and in terms of the biological diversity for Chinook salmon in the system, uh, they are at the southern range of their species, but they have um, four different runs of salmon that come back at different times of year. And so it really goes to show how much uh, the species has capitalized on uh, the different hydrological niches uh, in the system. Uh, but however, it's um, a, 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 a highly altered system uh, because of it's a huge water source for the state. And so there are dams along all the major rivers in this uh, watershed, uh, water diversions throughout the river, uh, levees along the lower part of the river to prevent flooding to uh, agricultural fields ne nearby, and uh, a lot of introduced species. And so all of these are putting a lot of pressure on this uh, radiation of Chinook salmon. Uh, the Chinook salmon in this uh, watershed support and play a huge role in the ocean salmon fisheries off of California and uh, southern Oregon. And uh, the fall run species is, uh, the fall run Chinook are um, uh, one of the largest stocks in the, uh, for the fisheries and they are an actively managed stock, meaning that every year there are pre-season forecasts and post-season assessments uh, for the stock along with uh, Klamath River fall Chinook. Uh, in this watershed, there's also winter run Chinook salmon, which are endangered, and so they are also actively managed um, in terms of avoiding impacts um, on this endangered uh, population. Uh, there's also late fall Chinook in the system and spring run Chinook, and they are not actively managed, but uh, spring run Chinook are a threatened uh, species, and so um, they're also um, tr uh, avoiding impacts on uh, Central Valley Spring Chinook. Uh, so I just wanted to spend uh, my time talking a little bit about all the different stocks in this system and kind of what are the key issues and what are and how I'm hoping to address some of them um, as part of my dissertation. Uh, so winter run Chinook salmon, again, this is the endangered uh, population. And so a lot of uh, harvest uh, is, uh, restrictions are geared towards avoiding impact on this, uh, on this stock. So um, size limits to avoid uh, harvest on these uh, smaller individuals. Um, but a key concern for this uh, population is that a lot of the data for management is derived from hatchery fish that are produced at the conservation hatchery. So uh, a big question here is whether the hatchery fish data uh, are representative of the, uh, of the wild fish that are rearing in the river. Uh, so one of the um, aspects of their life history that I'm looking at in terms of comparing the hatchery and the natural origin fish is how they differ in terms of their age structure because um, how long they are out, um, uh, how long they are out in the ocean until they mature can affect uh, their impact rates. And so one of the components of my research is comparing the age structure of hatchery and natural origin fish. Uh, and what we see is that um, in the hatchery fish, which are the yellow on the top, uh, that they have, um, they are more likely to um, return at age three uh, compared to the natural origin fish uh, at the bottom, which have a greater proportion of fish that are returning back at age four. And so what this means is that the natural origin fish, because they're staying out to sea for longer, um, are exposed to fisheries for a longer period of time and might have a greater impact rate compared to the hatchery fish and, and what the assessments uh, seem to show. Um, we also looked at how the age composition is affected by the fisheries. And um, in the years that we studied, the fishing impact is relatively low. So in terms of the bias that results from using hatchery fish data, um, it didn't result in a large bias, partially because the fishing is um, geared away towards this uh, stock. Um, 
we all, uh, I also was involved in looking at uh, the spring run Chinook salmon in the Central Valley, which again, this is a threatened uh, stock. And so they're not actively managed, but it's thought that some of the protections around a winter run may also uh, spill over and benefit uh, spring run as well. And in terms of what their life history and their ocean impacts are, um, it's thought to be that they are intermediate of winter run and fall run, uh, but again, they're not actively assessed. And so a key question with this stock was whether um, the actively managed stocks, winter run and fall run, are good proxies for uh, spring run Chinook. Uh, and so what uh, we did here was uh, look, compare the um, ocean impact rates and maturation rates uh, for uh, the sp spring run stock compared to the winter and the uh, fall run. And in terms of comparing their covariance and their correlation across years, we actually saw a very low uh, covariance between spring run and the other stocks. And so that would make um, interannual predictions uh, difficult. But in terms of the order of magnitude of their impact rates, for the uh, for the spring run fish, they're comparable to the fall run in um, in, a, in a lot of years. Um, another important thing to point out in terms of whether the uh, protections for winter run are benefiting uh, the spring run is that we see that the spring run have a lower um, H3 maturation rate compared to the winter run here in blue. And so what that means is that they are um, staying out to sea for a greater period of time compared to winter run, and so um, are less um, are benefiting less from uh, various size uh, restrictions um, in the ocean fisheries. Um, and then, lastly, um, this is what I'm working on now is for fall run Chinook salmon, and this is the uh, the backbone of the ocean salmon fisheries in the state. And it is um, the largest uh, population in the Central Valley, and it's made up of uh, four production hatcheries and eight major tributaries in the Sacramento Basin. Um, and again, this is an actively managed stock, meaning that every year there is a preseason forecast of the escapement, and that plays a really large role in uh, shaping the um, fishing uh, in the ocean for the year. Um, you may or may not be familiar that this year the ocean fisheries is closed, uh, partially because uh, the forecast uh, there the forecast is that there's going to be very low um, returns. And another component about the forecast um, about the forecast is that in the last eight years they've been uh, the forecasts have been consistently overestimating the escapement, and so. Um, this is partially potentially due to um, the data in the past not being representative of the ocean dynamics or the age structures currently. And so um, what I'm hoping to address uh, with, uh, with my fellowship project is looking at um, alternative forecast models and especially looking at whether more complicated models lead to um, better predictions, but predictions in a way that uh, changes management, not just um, improving the accuracy, but in a way that would actually change our decision making. Uh, so some of the things that I'm thinking about in terms of how to approach this is thinking about whether greater age structure would improve the forecasts, because uh, right now the stock is managed on a cohort, on a age, on a cohort um, based methods. And so looking at more, um, more complicated models uh, for age structure and evaluating how uh, alternatives would have performed in the past and also simulating future dynamics to see how they may potentially perform in the future. And some of the things that I'm thinking about in terms of uh, how to assess their performance is looking at uh, conservation goals such as uh, what's the average escapement, but also these critical threshold events that uh, can trigger uh, you know, alternative management um, such as falling below a minimum stock size, um, which can trigger um, which can result in um, the stock being designated as overfished. Um, and then I'm also looking at fishery uh, goals, such as what's the average allowable harvest from these um, different forecast models, and how often does the allowable harvest fall below a rate that might lead to uh, fishery closures. Uh, and so with that, I, I just want to thank the, uh, the fellowship and also uh, my advisor and my um, um, and my fellowship mentors, uh, Will Satterthwaite and uh, Michael Farrell. Thank you so much, Emily. 
And we'll move on to our last speaker. Nima Fashardi. Here you go. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Nima Fashadi. I'm a, um, a PhD candidate at San Diego State University. And I'm going to present on uh, some of the research I've done here uh, during my time as a fellow, looking at the impact of marine heat waves on the spatial distribution of pelagic fisheries. Um, globally, uh, our oceans are experiencing uh, prolonged discrete oceanic warm events, otherwise known as marine heat waves. And over the last century, the frequency and duration of marine heat waves um, has increased as a consequence of long-term ocean warming, um, with some hotspots of high marine heat wave intensity occurring in productive ocean regions, um, such as uh, um, you know, Western boundary current regions like the North, uh, Northeast U.S. continental shelf or the California current ecosystem. And the um, anomalous water temperatures from these marine heat waves are linked to a wide range of ecological and economic impacts, such as um, ma um, mass uh, uh, mortalities and strandings, shifts in species distributions, and alterations to ecosystem structure and func functioning. Um, however, these uh, ecological impacts uh, to marine heat waves can lead to pervasive impacts on fisheries and coastal communities. Uh, for example, by disrupting supply chains, um, compromising food safety, or um, altering essential habitat for target species. Um, marine heat waves, however, aren't all prominent as the ones depicted here on this map. Um, previous studies have shown that there's substantial variability in um, among heat wave events, and that certain regions can experience a flavor of marine heat waves, where some can be um, really large and severe and could last, you know, for several months or even years. Others are smaller and less intense, and then some can be somewhere in between. And this variability among heat waves can have um, large impacts on mobile pelagic species. Uh, that can shift their distributions pretty rapidly in response to unfavorable conditions that occur during these anomalous events. Uh, Bluefin tuna showed an example of this where their distribution shifted northward during um, the 2014 and 2016 uh, heat wave in the Northeast Pacific. And in this situation, um, Bluefin could have been considered like a marine heat wave winner um, because they could follow the warm patches of water from that heat wave. However, um, as heat waves can vary in size and intensity and their duration, um, they can yield a, uh, yield a range of responses by other pelagic fish and in turn have particularly pronounced impacts on the fisheries targeting them. Uh, and this is because now the distributions of these target pelagic species may move out of the range of the fishes who catch them, um, which can potentially cause economic disruptions due to um, shifting fishing grounds or changing changes in their yields. Therefore, although it is well established that there's variability in the properties of marine heat waves shown from the historical record, uh, we have not really applied this to fisheries to understand how this variation affects the spatial and temporal dynamics of fisheries. So to address this knowledge gap, we took a comparative approach to identify how um, pelagic um, uh, fleet spatial and temporal responses to heat waves varied among regions. Uh, to do this, we built uh, vessel distribution models using boosted regression trees. And these are really similar to species distribution models that um, Janelle uh, talked about. Uh, but here now we're correlating vessel locations with environmental data to predict um, what we call suitable fishing grounds. Um, to build our VDMs, our vessel distribution models, um, we use publicly available AIS fishing vessel data from Global Fishing Watch, and we focused on two economically important uh, U.S. pelagic fisheries. Uh, the first is the longline fleet in the Northwest Atlantic, which primarily targets swordfish, and the troll fleet in the Northeast Pacific, uh, which targets albacore tuna during the summer and fall months. And for the study, uh, we weren't just interested in um, this bi-coastal comparison of how these two fleets responded to marine heat waves, but how they differed at a sub-regional scale. And so to accomplish this, we took a management area approach 
where we looked at eight different um, management areas of the long line fleet, and then we subdivided the troll fleet into four management areas, and these are um, represented these, as these black boundaries on the map. And within each of these management areas, so for example, here we're going to be focusing on the NED management area. Uh, we also identified marine heat waves on a monthly scale and calculated um, marine heat wave properties such as intensity, uh, which was the average mean sea surface temperature anomaly of all cells classified as a marine heat wave. Uh, we looked at size or percent cover, which is the proportion of grid cells classified as marine heat wave in that. Uh, management area, and then duration, which um, identified consecutive months and management area was um, in a marine heat wave state. Additionally, to explore how the fleets responded to these properties um, within each management area, uh, we tracked two metrics. The first is change in core fishing ground area, which describes how productive an area is likely to be for a vessel of that fishery. And then the second is shifts in fleet distribution, uh, which is just describing how far the vessel's spatial distributions have adapted to such changing conditions. Um, so to examine how the fleet responded to um, heat wave variability and which of the properties had the greatest influence, um, we fitted a linear mixed effects model between our first metric, uh, change of core fishing ground area, and um, each of the um, uh, of the marine heat wave properties. And so what this plot shows are the coefficients for intensity, size, and duration for each management area uh, from the model. And um, they're, um, they're ordered latitudinally. And the asterisks that are on the bars are indicating which property influence uh, the greatest change for that management area. Um, and what the results tell us um, is that um, changes in core fishing ground area was um, driven primarily by size rather than intensity and duration across most of the management areas for the U.S. Atlantic Longline fleet and then all of the management areas for the uh, U.S. Pacific Patrol fleet. And what was interesting about this relationship between size and um, change in core fishing ground area is that it, this demonstrated a strong latitudinal gradient with northern fishing grounds expanding as heat wave size increased, while southern fishing grounds uh, experienced decreases in core fishing area. So for the U.S. Atlantic long fleet, long line fleet, this gradient was much more gradual as marine heat wave size demonstrated positive associations north of Cape Hatteras, so they were gaining fishing grounds as size increased here, uh, and then it steadily declined and turned negative south of the, of the Cape. Um, so they were losing fishing grounds as size increased. Um, we see the same trend for the U.S. Pacific Troll Fleet, um, but now um, it's the trend is a little bit more stronger and it's it's, and it's fully positive um, between its most no northern and um, southern management area. So taking a look back at that NED management area, I want to demonstrate the influence um, size has on core fishing ground area between two marine heat waves that had the same intensities, um, but vastly different sizes. The first was a marine heat wave that occurred during May of 2012. Many of you may be familiar with that one. It was pretty prominent in that region. And um, this marine heat wave occupied 48% of the area of that management area. And as you can see from the figure on the right, uh, which shows gains and losses in core fishing grounds, there's a large amount of yellow indicating gains in that region. Now here is a smaller marine heat wave during May of 2014 of the same intensity as the one above, uh, but now it only covers 4% of that um, management area. And looking at its corresponding map, um, of changes in core fishing ground area, the fleet had lost quite a bit amount of fishing grounds compared to the one above. Moving on to the second metric, uh, here are histograms of distances showing how far the fleet shifted during heat waves, uh, during months classified as a heat wave, so in red, and uh, months that were not a marine heat wave in blue. And to test that the fleet shifted further during heat wave, we just performed KS tests between the two. Um, marine heat wave states. And so the bolded p-values are when the fleet did shift further during a heat wave. 
Uh, so starting with the Atlantic Longline Fleet, which again are um, ordered latitudinally, we again see this similar latitudinal trend as the first metric where the Longline Fleet south of Cape Hatteras demonstrated this, um, demonstrated significant um, further shifts during heat wave conditions. Um, however, northern regions did not displace themselves that much differently um, during a heat wave or not. We didn't see the same trend though for the troll fleet. Here, the peripheral um, management areas, so Vancouver and uh, areas off of Monterey, um, uh, they exhibited the furthest displacement during heat wave conditions compared to management areas where actually most of the effort is taken place, which is um, around Columbia and uh, Eureka. Overall, um, our analysis showed that while there are similarities, um, and how the two plastic fleets will respond, there are also differences in terms of how productive an a region will be and, and how much space is available to fish in. Our models predict that both, both fisheries and northern regions are more resilient to marine heat waves, while the southern management areas may be more vulnerable. However, how the fleets may shift their distributions in response may differ between the two. Um, as long lines in the southern regions will have to travel further to find suitable habitat, but the troll fleet is in those peripheral management areas. And so this may suggest that um, the southern management areas for the Atlantic longline fleet may be very vulnerable to marine heat waves because not only are they losing core fishing grounds, but they're also subject to higher travel costs to find such fishing grounds. And um, all in all, I think you know, the effort from this research can really help expand our knowledge of the spatial and temporal dynamics of, of um, the footprint of fishing effort and can help in the aid and development of climate resilient management. A um, bunch of people to thank. Um, uh, this project was part of this um, of FACET, which I'll get into in a little bit, but huge thanks to my advisor and that whole team, Becca Lucen, as well as my NOAA mentor there, um, uh, Elliot Hazen. Um, and then also a uh, uh, big thanks to um, the the NIMS Sea Grant Pop Dive Fellowship, um, which um, I couldn't do with uh, those funds helped me do this project and also other stuff that I'm planning on presenting at the uh, symposium. Um, and uh, lastly, just a small plug in about that FASA project, which this part this study was part of, um, it focuses on developing products to support climate uh, ready and resilient uh, fisheries and um, specifically fisheries that are targeting highly migratory species in the Atlantic and the Pacific. If you're interested in more about the FASA project, you can go to the project website or the dashboard website and where you can um, take a look at other analyses and even play around with this analysis too. And um, yeah, um, look, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of this webinar. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nima. Uh, Amanda, if you wanted to come back on and give another quick plug for that symposium. So thank you all again for listening and thank you fellows for volunteering to um, chat about some of your research um, through the NOAA library. Um, again, if you wanna find out more about the fellows who just spoke, who you just heard from their work, as well as the rest of their cohorts um, research, please come to the symposium. It'll be in Silver Spring, um, July 31st through August 2nd. There will be virtual aspects, but um, if you visit the National Sea Grants website, you will be able to find um, the registration information and the agenda and the abstracts and everything. So thanks again. Thank you, Amanda. I don't see any questions in the question panel. So I will just say again, thank you to all of our attendees and to our speakers today. And with that, I'm going to end it a little early. So thank you guys. Thank you, everyone. I hope you, um, everyone, audience and uh, speakers have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care.